Good afternoon. I'm Richard Worrell, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the American Finance Association to the latest interview with uh, one of the founding contributors to Modern Finance. And I'm happy to say today that the interview will be with Steve Ross, uh, my longtime friend and co-author, who is uh, a prolific writer. We'll talk about the papers that, uh, as we go along, but before we do that, uh, tell me about some background. I grew up in Boston. Uh, my mom was a, a stayed at home, and my dad was a chemical engineer, a really great guy. He had uh, put his way through night school to become a chemical engineer, first in his family to go to college. And growing up in a suburb of Boston, Brookline is where I grew up. It was a great place to grow up, and uh, to some extent, whatever I have, I feel I owe to those two people. Mm -hmm. They're from Russia, right, originally? So originally from so Russia. Your, your name used to be Ross and Kosky or something no, like that? No, actually, it's always been Ross. It's always been Ross. How did, people, they're people, Russian Rosses? Is that? People don't understand that. They, <laughs> the Ross began, actually, the name is a Scottish name, and the apocryphal story in the family, which I have actually have some background for, is that an itinerant sewing machine salesman from Edinburgh came to, uh, key, to, to Minsk, and married a nice Jewish girl, and <laughs> Ross stayed. He sense. stayed. Huh? He stayed for a brief, a brief enough time to do some damage. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you went to high school and where? Went and to high school in Brookline. Brookline High? Yeah, Brookline High, Brookline Schools and Brookline High. So how did you do in school? Was that, was that okay? I was a pretty good student. Pretty good, okay. I was a pretty good student. After you graduated from high school, you went to Caltech, right? I did. How did a kid from... Boston end up at uh, in Pasadena. I want to get as far away as possible. <laughs> I like I like the Beach Boys. I like uh, all the stuff going on in California. It sounds like a great place to be. And I think the real reason was a guy came out. That was the early stages when colleges and universities would recruit from broader geographic areas. Mm -hmm. And this fellow came from uh, Pasadena to the high schools in Boston and gave the pitch about Caltech, and it was an extraordinary pitch. And to this day, I really am very fond of Caltech. I'm on the board now at Caltech, so I love the place. Mm -hmm. And he just said, this is the best place in the world to study science and things, and that's what I really cared about, science and stuff. Who were some of the people, some of the professors at Caltech that you remember the most? Was Feynman. Feynman was Richard the, Feynman was Richard there. Feynman, yeah. I had him for four years. Mm -hmm. I had him for freshman physics, sophomore physics. I had him for a seminar in cosmology in my junior year, and I had him in my senior year. Uh, I attended the theoretical physics workshop, mm -hmm. and to this day, he's the smartest guy I ever met. Really? Yeah. I met a lot of smart people in the university, but I never met anyone as smart as him. Yeah. yeah he well, he's a legend actually. And Murray Gell-Mann was his uh, was there too. I don't know if you. He was pretty good. He was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's a. We all be. Had, well, I'll tell you a funny story. We went to freshman class. The first class he had as a freshman was uh, Feynman teaching physics. And every kid in the room thinks they're the smartest kid in the world. And it's just the world is waiting to find out. And about 15 minutes into this class, there's this hum in the room that you can almost see. And the kid next to me turns to me and says, this guy is really smart, you know? <laughs> and everyone in the room knew the guy at the front was smarter than any of us. The second class was Linus Pauling teaching chemistry. Yeah. And we all thought, he's no Feynman. <laughs> <laughs> the education really is wasted on the young, I think. <laughs> well, after Caltech, did you, you went directly to Harvard then? Or? I went directly to Harvard. To yeah. economics, yeah. To economics. I was yeah. interested. I had asked where well, you could study game theory. Only at Caltech. To fulfill your humanities requirement in the senior year, you were allowed to take a course called Game Theory and Linear Programming. Hmm. So that fulfilled my humanities <laughs> requirement. And it was really fascinating. And I said, this is what I want to do. I like the math much better than I did boundary value problems, mm -hmm. much better than I did differential equations. Mm -hmm. And then my last year, I had the great good fortune of Ken Arrow coming. That's what I think. And I was his assistant. So I TA'd for him. And that's when I discovered that you know, there was real genius in economics. Mm -hmm. After Harvard, you graduated, you went to Wharton. Right? Went to Wharton. Okay, and you started writing papers in, in economics first. Or I know you wrote some papers in trade theory, stuff General like that. General equilibrium, General growth equilibrium. theory, trade theory, yeah. pure theory of trade, stuff yeah. like that. And, and then you wrote, a, uh, I guess, was your first paper in finance the one about the principles problem, the agency Principal theory? agent problem. Principal but, agent yeah. problem. Yeah. But some people think that's finance. Some people think it's economics. So 
As I said, they had a strong group of uh, professors at Wharton, young professors. Carl Schell was there, Bob Pollock was there, and a variety of others who, for the purpose of this story, will remain unnamed. And after I published this paper, one of them came up to me and said, Steve, you know, we think you have some potential uh, here, but uh, you're going to have to do some serious work, not stuff like this. <laughs> so I was kind of at sea. That paper predated this paper by Jensen and Meckley, which, uh, you know, so did they get their idea from your paper? Well, I, that's for them to tell you. Well, I, so. I don't know. I mean, it was an idea that was around. I thought it was uh, well, the idea a is from there. Idea. It, the idea is in the Bible. You know, if you talk to some rabbis, they'll tell you that the principal agent is discussed in, I don't know, Leviticus or something like that. Right? So there's it, nothing to do it, with it's it. Also in the, it's also in the Talmud, too. The Talmud? It has, <laughs> it has, it has a long uh, religious and historical yeah. tradition, you know. I certainly didn't invent the idea. I thought what was interesting about the idea was the whole question of incentives. How do you get, if you're my agent, how do I motivate you to do what I would do if I had the information and the capacities that you have as my agent? You were in economics department at, at Wharton, so how did you switch over to finance? So I asked around what seminars I should go to and you know, what should I do? So someone said, well, you should go to the labor seminar. I didn't like that at all. <laughs> someone said the econometric seminar. So, and I knew about that. I actually taught econometrics some at Wharton, but I thought, you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't so good. Then someone said, you should go to the finance seminar. So I went to the finance seminar, and the first guy was this young guy from Carnegie named Richard Roll, oh. <laughs> talking about the term structure of interest rates. He used was the very first seminar I ever heard in finance. You know, mm -hmm. And I said, gee, this stuff is really fascinating, you know? <laughs> and I didn't fully understand what you were saying, but I thought it was really interesting. So I resolved to be a regular participant. So I went next week, and they had this guy, Fisher Black, yeah. talking about the Black-Scholes model. A bunch of no names in there. Give yeah. the so, so I thought to myself, you know, I had been trained by Howard Rafe, I thought it was a status, I was a Bayesian. <laughs> so I concluded that was the average quality of people in finance. Yeah, it turned out to be a disappointing rest of the year, you know, but, yeah. but I was hooked right from that moment uh, where you guys talked about uh, you and then him, and I said, that's what I really like to do. So, Steve, you started being interested in finance. You started reading finance, and then did that lead to the APT? Uh, it did. I, yeah. I, How did that well, work I, out? I first approached some people in finance and told them that I was very interested in it. I told people in the economics department I was very interested in it. I think I had this line that passed around. When I told a senior professor that I was really interested in finance, he said to me, finance is to economics as osteopathy is to medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so I subsequently told him they've given six Nobel Prizes in osteopathy. <laughs> you know. uh, but I started to study it. I wanted to figure out what it was all about. And there was all this talk about the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to people and saying, is that the average cost or the marginal cost? And they hadn't really, that wasn't what they thought of. They didn't think of it in those terms. And they said it came out of the capital asset pricing model. So I said, okay, I want to read about that. So I read about that. And I, the words, uh, it was like uh, the words and the music didn't fit. The math didn't fit the words. Mm -hmm. And uh, the intuitions were much better than the mathematics that described it. So the APT came from my attempt to really sort of understand what was going on and to sort of make the math consistent with what I thought the good intuitions were in the mm -hmm. field. So the, the APT, I remember reading the paper when you first, I guess the, there were several versions of that paper. I think one of them was presented at a conference out in Colorado. Do you remember that conference? I do, we I do. Uh, Erwin Friend and Erwin Marshall Friend, Bloom. Marshall Bloom and so yeah. out there. And uh, it was pretty, uh, caused quite a sensation. It was the first multi-factor model, really, of finance. And it also had this equilibrium condition, the, the no arbitrage condition. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was uh, still today. I think that's the probably the leading candidate for the for asset pricing. Don't you think? I mean, I... well, I I do. I think there's a lot of technical stuff that surrounds it that has uh, obscured some of the merit of thinking of things in that way. Mm -hmm. But my perspe perception of finance, at least of neoclassical finance, is that the core of it isn't equilibrium so much as it is the absence of arbitrage. Yeah. You know, and you just ring out of that simple view that you can't make money for free as much as you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that was the basis of the M&M theorems too, right? The and of Black-Scholes. Black-Scholes. Black-Scholes and, Black yeah. and that. Yeah. You know, the difference there is that the APT is a, is a risk-return 
arbitrage relationship, which uh, is a little bit different, let's say, than Medigliani Miller or Black and Scholes. But, well, that paper got a lot of, uh, a lot of notoriety. It was followed by a paper that we did with Naifu Chen, uh, macro, macro factors in stock market uh, and the arbitrage price, where we tried to identify these factors. And so, tell us about that paper. Well, I, I always thought that was sort of a disappointment to me. I thought the three of us did a darn good job of a priori identifying what we thought would be important. Things like measures of risk, inflation, mm -hmm. uh, GDP stuff, you know, real economic variables that we thought would be important in that. And there's been an enormous literature that's followed, so we didn't, we didn't just uh, comb through all the data we could to find the things that fit the best. Mm -hmm. We had this a priori thing built on an intuition that said, this is what really should matter for pricing. And we tested it. And now there's hundreds of papers that have come afterwards. I'm a little disappointed that they seem to think that they did it before we did it. <laughs> but that's always the way of the field, I think. Yeah. You um, started looking at option pricing a little bit later with John Cox, maybe? Was that the first? It was uh, with John. Uh -huh. uh, we, John had, had come back with a thesis. Back uh, from where? He, he had been, at, I think, at Wisconsin as an assistant professor. And he'd come uh -huh. back to present his thesis. And I was the person who could deal with it because I knew differential equations and things like that. So they asked if I'd be on his committee and I looked at this thesis and it was just brilliant. And like many of John's work, wasn't published. <laughs> but it was a, a careful study of the different relationships amongst uh, the players in a partnership. Mm -hmm. And John and I instantly became friends and colleagues and started to work together. And once again, it was an example of something where somehow or other something was missing. You, you know, you sort of solve these option pricing problems by turning to the mathematics books to figure mm -hmm. out how to solve these equations. And it occurred to us that there was kind of a deeper intuition at work there, and that led to our stuff on risk-neutral pricing. Mm -hmm. So what, tell, tell us about that. How does well, that work? If you've got a situation where there's no arbitrage, so like the option price is locked into the stock price because if it wasn't, you'd be able to make money for sure by shorting one mm -hmm. and going long on the other. Then that means that preferences really can't matter at all. That was our first intuition. So wouldn't care if you were very risk averse or less risk averse or what, you'd get the same answer to the same problem mm -hmm. because it's locked in. So it occurred to us, well, let's pick the simplest one. Suppose everyone is just risk neutral, then would have to work. Mm -hmm. And that led immediately to saying that pricing has to be by a risk-neutral expectation. Mm -hmm. And so that it was kind of interesting that... that well, it also makes things a lot solution. simpler, right? Because you can always solve the math a lot easier if you have risk neutrality. It was right? much Just easier. expectations is all yeah, you need. Yeah, right? much so. easier to solve math. So mm -hmm. our old intuition about discounted expected value came back. It's yeah. discounted expected value, but you might as well assume that things go at the interest rate. Right. So rather than being a trick, it became something you could understand. And that's been used in a lot of uh, applications since then. Risk-neutral pricing is like kind of the, the way it's done for not just in academics, but that's actually done, it's used uh, you know, in practice too. You know, On the street, but I think we've got to apologize for that now, I guess. We have to apologize <laughs> for <laughs> but, but No, the way you price, as you know better, better than I, you price any complicated instrument. Hmm. is you just put together a collection of scenarios and take the risk-neutral expectation. Assume hmm. that things grow at the interest rate and take the expected value and discount it back. And, you know, all sorts of interesting uh, complications and additions and amendments come in, but that's the heart and soul of what people do. So <clears throat> following that, you got into this, the binomial pricing thing with, with uh, Mark Rubenstein and Cox, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, how did the, what was the sequence of events well, we there? Actually, John and I had actually done that uh, in one of our early papers, but it was a continuous time thing with a binomial model where it, things would either go up or go down. That's mm -hmm. so the same thing. And we teamed up with Mark, who really was on top of this stuff and created this model that did it. And the model solved an interesting question. People kept saying, well, this works because time is continuous and you get to take derivatives and do all that math. And it really had nothing to do with it at all. Mm -hmm. It works because <coughs> only two things can happen. And the binomial can, of course, converge to a continuous time model. So that it was really nice to see that you were down now to the core intuition of why this option pricing worked. It was just about spanning and some traditional notions in economics and finance. 
Well, but the, I mean, the binomial model, though, has is, is got a lot of practical applications because it's very easy to put, to solve any kind of a complicated uh, option pricing or derivative pricing formula by using a binomial approach, right? Yeah, it's like an erector set. You yeah. can build whatever you want. Yeah. You know, you just assume a binomial or some variant. So I of that think probably in Wall Street and a lot of these hedge funds and stuff like that, that's they they basically all are using that approach to solve. As, as far as uh, I can tell, that's all they use. Except yeah. there's always a coterie of mathematicians who want to try another way to solve something. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes down to actually pricing a security and trading a security and doing that, that's what they all do. How about this paper you did with um, on Tobin's Q? Let's talk about that a little bit. So, what is Tobin's Q first, just for the record we should uh, well, it's, it's this very clever uh, variable, and sometimes variables are clever. It's the ratio of the market value of a firm, say, to its replacement cost. Mm -hmm. And the market value is not too hard to find. You look at the stocks and the bonds and uh, all the obligations, and you add them all up, and that's the market value. The replacement cost is very tricky because it's hard to say what it really costs to replace you know, the assets of a company. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, what are the assets of Coca-Cola? I mean, is it just the bottling plants and the secret formula? So no, I think it's also the fact that you've got generations of people who drink Coca-Cola and they sort of, it's part of their, like Microsoft, it's wired into their head to use Windows. It's wired mm -hmm. into their head to drink Coke. And that's not measured in the replacement cost, the accountant's measure of the value of what it would cost to replace the assets, but it is measured in the total value of the firm. So uh, Eric Lindenberg and I wrote this paper. We said, you know, you could use that variable to see how much intangible assets a company mm -hmm. has. They never went down the route of looking at it for investments, mm -hmm. but it just seemed to me that when you look cross-sectionally, companies that do a lot of R&D, companies that do a lot of advertising, companies that have a lot of kind of uh, unmeasurable forms of capital should score very high on Tobin's Q, and that's how it worked out. How about turning a little bit to the uh, business side of things? Uh, you know, tell us something about being on boards of directors and uh, serving in the capacities you served at General Re, for instance, and uh, things like that. What kind of experience has that been? It was wonderful for me. I very much enjoyed being a member of a board of directors. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a chance. It, it was sort of the be it's the best of all words. You get a chance to think about issues of strategy think about complicated issues of risk control, to think about the practical issues of running a real corporation without having the day-to-day -day responsibility of actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So it was perfect for me, just as a, I can't do econometrics by myself, I don't think I could do run a company. Mm -hmm. So it was really a great opportunity to have an impact and to have influence and to learn an enormous amount. And to this day now, a huge amount of my kind of practical kit bag of knowledge, kit bag of knowledge, comes from the experiences I had on boards. And it also broadened my mind to the range of talents that people have. So typically on a good board, you have some very, very smart people, but they don't come out of our background. They're not uh, formal, analytic, uh, academic, but they're just really smart. And they, they've taken the experiences they've had over the years and distilled them into a, a knowledge set that gives them the ability to take action in a sensible way. And also, I must say, in this new environment where corporate governance looms so large, uh, I've always been amused by corporate governance advocates, uh, m most of whom, as, if I, as I can find, <laughs> never have served on a board, or indeed never even been to a board meeting. So I'm sort of a cynic about that kind of movement. Mm -hmm. But in the new environment, things have changed. Uh, Ten years ago, serving on a board was to some extent a privilege. It was honorific. And also, you spent a lot of time talking about the issues I described, economic strategy stuff. Now we spend enormous amounts of time on boards talking about financial disclosure, legal coverage, regulatory issues. And one wonders what you're disclosing if you didn't have time to talk about strategy. Yeah. What's next on your research agenda and on your business agenda? Let's, let's research and business? Yeah, both. 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 Okay, yeah. well, research, I've been working with uh, on three different things. One is, you might be familiar with the papers with uh, Leonard Kogan and Zhang Wang mm -hmm. and uh, Mark Westerfield on just trying to get a handle on this question of uh, an old question that goes back, in fact, to pure theory of trade and Milton Friedman and that, 
which is, will the market somehow or other take the money away from people who aren't terribly gifted at being in the market? People who have less information or people mm -hmm. who act irrationally. Will the market sort of weed them out? And the results from very technical and stylized models are that it's not necessarily the case. These people can last forever. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of interesting and counterintuitive to me. But you wonder whether that or not... That sounds like it's inconsistent with evolutionary theory. You know, so. It is, and that's what I find counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether or not are the models we have are doing a good job at giving people the ability to actually find ways to take these money from these people. These biologists have models of this same exact phenomena, where the you know, an animal that's not adapted to the environment, the environment changes and they become unadapted, well, they, 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 die, they, out. they, they die out. And so what's the difference between economics and biology? That's well, that. our guys can be not adapted, but can behave in ways that are you know, very much in their interest. I'll give you an old example. So uh, you know that if you maximize the growth rate in your portfolio, eventually with probability one, you'll beat every other strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got a bunch of people who are quite risk averse and one person who's really stupid and has everything wrong, you know, but somehow there's a little less risk averse and closer to maximizing the growth rate, they can survive. Mm -hmm. You can also have people survive if they just don't consume as much. Mm -hmm. So maybe the, you can think of that as sort of a variety of ways they can adapt to not knowing as much as other people Well, that's do. kind of, that's just another uh, dimension of adaptation, right. which is... Agree. Uh, agree. Makes them different from like the evolutionary story. Yeah, I agree. Right? I agree. Yeah. Well, another thing I'm working on is social security. Okay. So I've been working on that and broad things with Larry. What Conley should we Cuff. do with social security? Huh? We should cry. Uh, we have, a, <laughs> and it turns out that we owe a lot of money in social security. Yeah. And the technology there is interesting because it's sort of stuff that isn't fully. We, we haven't really worked out all these problems in finance, so. You look at a social security contract, which is a promise to pay someone a certain amount of money when they retire based on the average of their past wages and things. And the way the government now figures that out and figures out the taxes they're going to collect for it is they have economists project what the rate of growth is going to be going forward mm -hmm. and what GNP is going to be and what wages will be and then discount them back at some interest rate. And it occurred to us that this is really just a basic financial contract. It's a derivative contract, and so you got to treat it that way and use the machinery of finance, modern finance, to figure out what the value is. Mm -hmm. So we've applied that to Social Security, and now we're applying to the whole range of government entitlement programs, to everything the government's going to spend. In so you could apply this to the health care plan that's kind of yep. the uh, national yeah. health care system. And Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. So what is the total, if you apply the option, this method to Social Security, what's the current uh, I, liability. I, I believe uh, it's about a trillion dollars in deficit. A trillion dollars? I can't yeah. remember for sure. No, that's only one fourth of the deficit this year. It's not. That's nothing. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> nothing. But no, you're right. It's not a lot, but you know, it adds up <laughs> over time. You know, a trillion here and a trillion there. And I guess the third thing I'm doing is, uh, I'm I'm increasingly interested in this question of contracts as devices for sort of weeding out people in financial markets and getting people, you know, sort of segregating people and trying to understand them and how that would arise, as you say, evolution, how it would arise in some endogenous way. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing around with stuff like that. But that's at the doodling stage. That's what about the, the business side? What are you doing well, there? the business, you know well, you know, two things. We're working on Compensation Valuation Incorporated, which has changed, morphed into uh, Ross Farrar, which is a business that creates financial products for companies to hedge against the exposure that they have to the options they've issued to the employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, And the effort is to turn that into more of an investment banking business. And I always manage money for people. I have these wealthy people who I continue to manage money for. So that, you know, it sort of grew out of our business role in Ross. I discovered mm -hmm. you can unwind an investment management business, but you can't unwind some clients. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to stick with you all the time. So those are the two business things I do. Well, thanks very much, Steve. And thanks, Thank everybody, you, for listening. Thank you, Dick.